since you were uh, a young scientist and an outstanding young scientist. Still am a young scientist. Still are a young scientist, but you won an award for being the brightest, youngest scientist. You won so many awards, but that was one of them. What's changed in your field since you were a, a, a young grad at, at McGill or MIT? Well, you know, we have... I think you know we're really in the golden age of brain research. We have so many more tools. You know, I talked to you about imaging. We didn't have any of that. We couldn't right. look into the brain. There's another revolutionary technology that is coming down the pipe now. It's called optogenetics. So would you believe we can now steal genes from an algae uh, and stick it into our brains, or certainly into a mouse's brain, and then we can tickle particular classes of neurons. They will respond, once we stick that gene into uh, these neurons, that you know, we can then shine light of a particular wavelength, say orange light, and we can turn on only those neurons, and we can then make them fire. We can stimulate a particular population of neurons, and we can say, what happens when just those cells become active? So, you know, you might think that, well, you know, we took out the, this piece of brain or somebody had a stroke and they lost this piece of brain and they're not addicted to cigarettes anymore. So we know that. That's good. That's powerful. But now what we can do is we can, we don't have to rely on damage. We can, like, oh. put, uh, uh, you know, this gene into uh, a mouse. We can get the mouse addicted we can shine light on onto those cells and we can shut them down. We can either shut them down or turn them on, whichever we like. Okay, so the future of stimulating the brain is important for preventing diseases, for curing diseases, for making us smarter, for what? Yes. All of the above? <laughs> All of the above. So I was talking earlier about understanding the brain as a connectome, mm. as a group of, it's, it's, it's a little bit like Facebook, you know? <laughs> so you got like 100 billion neurons in there, and every neuron has about 10,000 Facebook friends with whom they directly communicate. And the question is, who are your Facebook friends going to be? Who are you going to talk to as a neuron? And it turns out it's going to be, you know, whoever you went to high school with. Right. It's going to turn, like in, in a part of your brain called the hippocampus, which, by the way, that part of your brain is about uh, 20 years younger than you are. Because what? it constantly generates new baby neurons. Okay. So the average age is less than the rest mm. of you. So I look uh, old, but my hippocampus looks young. Younger. younger. It, unfortunately, you're making fewer new neurons as okay. you get older and older. But it turns out that the neurons that are born at the same time, they all go through the babbling phase together. Mm. They babble to each other. And when they babble to each other, they all become friends. And they go to high school together. And they become connected. So those neurons are connected to each other. It turns out that under some, that's actually why when you learn something, those new neurons are involved in learning something. That's why, we, you know, when you think about something you learned in high school, uh, it brings back all the other things that happen in high school, all those old girlfriends and all that music. It all right. comes back right. because it's all the same group of new baby neurons that were born at the same time that have all connected to each other. Now, stimulation is a way for us to change the weights of the pathways of the connectome. So let's say you're a kid with, I don't know, make something up, dyslexia. Mm -hmm. We now know from mapping the brain and seeing where the wires are that the connection from here to there, V1 to V5, is too weak in dyslexia. Interesting. It's, it's just and not as strong as... as uh, ADHD and ADHD, many. schizophrenia, it looks like there's a dysfunction in the connection between the prefrontal cortex and another structure called the hippocampus. So we're learning these things. Now, okay, so great to know that these pathways are too weak. What can we actually do about it to help people? And the answer is we can exercise the pathway like you exercise a muscle. We can go, let's say we it's too weak from here to there we go bang 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 we stimulate we make them fire together okay so you're a young kid and you fall off the teeter totter you're uh, an older kid and you and you hit a rock on the ski hill and bang your head you're a football player an NFLer and you get a severe concussion mm -hmm. how serious oh it can be very serious it can be very serious uh, 
the good news is, um, what I tell people is, if you're going to have your brain damage, have it early. <laughs> because <laughs> the young brain has much more recuperative oh. capacity uh, than does the older brain. Because you still haven't you know, fully allocated all your Facebook friends. Right. You still have room to, oh, well, okay, that Facebook friend has been taken out by the rock. Okay, mm -hmm. well, I can get somebody else. When you're older, it's not that easy to make new friends if you're in your No, own. I understand, but they have been linking, and I, when I say they, I don't know if these are the top scientists, concussion to suicide. Oh, absolutely. So what happens if you have, you know, these problems older in life, if bad things happen? Well, uh, Yes, um, it turns out that you know brain injury is a subtle thing because first of all you don't see it. Somebody right. has a brain injury, okay, they might have a bruise on their mm -hmm. skull, they might you know get shaved, and, but then the hair grows back and oh. you don't see anything. Um, but the recovery process can be prolonged. The other thing we know is that if you look in the brains of these NFL athletes and you look at them. What you can see sometimes 10 years later, here's a, a typical story, somebody's an NFL lineman for 10 years, you know, finishes, retires, has a fair amount of cash by now, opens a chain of laundromats, 10 years later, you find he's totally falling apart, depressed, anxious, short fuse, his marriage fails, can't run the business, commits suicide. Yes. And then when you look at the brain, what you see is degeneration. What you see are the same tau tangles that you see in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. So they actually have a form of dementia and it can manifest if parts of the brain that are involved in regulating your impulses and your emotions, it can manifest as uh, suicide, short fuse, inability to control yourself, uh, screw ups in your social relationships. Mm -hmm. It's, it's actually a big impact. It's, it's a big, literally a big impact, mm -hmm. and the danger is that it will continue to get worse. I talked to a colleague who studies NFL and hockey players, and I asked her, her name is Ann McGee, she's in Boston, I said, so what would you say are the odds that an NFL lineman has brain damage? And she said, 92%. Right, unless you're the kicker. <laughs> yeah, if you're the kicker, you're okay. And you might be as okay. As long as you don't get sacked, I think it's being a, you know, it's, of it's the repeated of course. hits. Mm -hmm. We'll take a break. Uh, Dr. Max Sinatter, our guest, he's a professor of great big brain.